beginning of the message when I was talking about stuff that was right here in the building that you can't see, but it's real. I think they thought for just a while that I was maybe pulling their leg a little bit when I said, how much information is here? Um, hundreds of television broadcast are available right here and the only reason you don't see them is you don't have a receiver radio transmissions come through here i was talking about how wi-fi from the surrounding area has put the internet right here and all the information the power of the internet is here the only reason you do not take advantage of that if you don't is because you don't have a proper receiver and um and so the prophetic word is here you know, that's an amazing thought, that any given time when the people of God get together, that the word of the Lord is present. Sometimes folks may not be aware of that. That's just because they do not have the receiver to make them aware of what God is doing, what God is saying, what he's speaking in any given place. But as we got into the message last week, we looked at the uh, book of Ephesians and saw that Paul encouraged the Ephesians to, to put on the whole armor of God because there were things that we don't see. We don't really see our enemies. We have enemies, but we don't see them because our enemies are not flesh and blood. Our, our enemies are principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, they're our enemies. We don't see our enemies, and we don't really see our, our weapons. Our weapons are not things that we can arm ourselves with in the natural. They're not firearms. They're not explosives. But they're things that are unseen. They are the things that we have been armed with. I want you to understand today that when hard things come into your life, it's not because you are unlucky. It's not because of happenstance. But many times there are difficulties that are put in front of you by the enemy. I, I don't like to talk a lot about the devil and give him credit. I don't like to mention him much when I'm praying. I know I've told before my wife, she prays, and she sometimes prays loud, but when she really prays loud, she's not talking to God. She's always talking to the devil. You get out of here, that's not where you, that you don't belong. You can't touch that. That's covered by the blood of Jesus. And, and she won't let him hang around. She chases him out when she prays. I, I don't even like to mention him when I'm preaching to you, but the fact is, there is a devil. I, I had a man leave the church because he said, I think that preacher believes that there's a really a devil. I thought, man, where in the world has that guy been living that he was not aware that we are facing an enemy that's like a roaring lion walking to and fro, seeking whom he may devour? If he doesn't know that, I don't know what kind of a cave he's been living in. But I'm here to tell you today that you are not uh, having bad things happen because God's mad at you, but instead, if you have bad things that are coming in your life, you can rest assured every good and perfect gift is from above. God's given that to you. The hard things that you're faced with is because the devil has a plan against you. And I want you to know that you cannot defeat your enemy by developing a better self-image. You're going to have to have the power of God. These battles that we are in are not philosophical. They're not things that we think upon church, get a better mental attitude, and then go through the world encouraged. But instead, the battles that we're fighting are real world conflicts. They're surrounding us just as real as the radio waves, unseen but real. And they are more in, all inclusive. That is the enemy looking at every area of your life to find a place to attack you. They are more all-inclusive than the information that is on the Internet. 
So we've got to take up arms before we are prepared to face the enemy. Now, um, we, we talked about the enemy being someone we can't see. We can't see our enemies. We can't see our weapons. But there are things that we must pick up. When we were um, looking at the book of Ephesians last week, we discovered that we were told that we needed to be uh, gird up. We need to gird up our loins and cover our loins with truth. We need to take the breastplate of righteousness. We needed to shod our, you put on shoes, shod ourselves with the preparation of the gospel and the shield of faith. Do you see, these are things that we do. These things that I've named for you are things that we do. Some people are just waiting on God to come and bring them deliverance. But if you really want to live in victory, then there are certain things that we must do. Truth, righteousness, the preparation of the gospel. That does not come by osmosis. That comes by personal and diligent study of the gospel. That's how we take on these weapons. These are things that we do. And our faith. Someone says, well, I don't have much faith. Well, you've got some faith. Oh, I wish I had more faith. Well, there are way to get, there's a way to get more faith, but it's not by wishing. We don't get more faith by wishing. We get more faith by hearing the Word of God. We get more praying in the Spirit. We get more faith by experience. Faith comes to us and grows inside us. But it's important for us to know that everybody has some. God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. He said, well, I don't have faith. Oh, yes, you do. And I know that this sounds argumentative, and, and there may not be a lot to be gained by it sometimes by getting into discussion, but I absolutely cannot stand. It's, it's hard for me to forbear. I feel like Jeremiah when he said, I decided I wasn't going to talk about the Lord anymore. And he said, but it was like fire shut up in my bones. That's how it is with me when I get around somebody and say, well, I'm an atheist. Well, you are a liar, but you're not an atheist. So I don't believe God. Yes, you do. You can claim you don't, and you can try to forget him. But when God made you, he put faith in you, and you got it. Someone said, well, I don't believe it. I said, I'll tell you this. Let God be true and every man a liar. You say, I don't believe God. God said, I put faith in you, and I believe God. Yeah. So I'm here to tell you today that you've got it and you just need to help it grow give it an opportunity to grow inside you these weapons are weapons that we take up but now i want you to see the most important weapons are not even weapons that we can take up you know the wonderful story david as a little boy goes into the army of where his brothers were fighting for saul and he that's when he becomes aware for the first time that the enemy had a giant that would come out, a champion that would come out and would verbally defile the armies of God and ridicule them, make fun of them, and say, if there's anybody in your whole army that will come and fight me, and if he can beat me, we'll be your servants, and if I beat him, you will be our servants. And so David came down to meet the giant and... Um, when Saul, because of desperation, decided, the king decides to let this little boy go out here and face the giant because he's the only one in the whole army that was willing to. Desperation, he says, here, let me give you my armor. And um, did, did you, do you remember being taught this story maybe when you were in children's church or vacation Bible school or Sunday school as a child, and they always told you how David would try, he, he put on that helmet of Saul and, and, or put on the coat of mail and said, well, this is too big, I can't, it, it doesn't fit me. But if you read that story, that is not what David said. He did not say it's too big, it can't, I, I don't, it doesn't fit. What he said is, I have never tried these things before. I've never proven them. I've never used these weapons before. The weapon that I have used, he said, was a shepherd's sling. And um, 
I'm fairly confident in telling you that I don't believe that the great, perhaps the greatest soldier in the armies of the Philistines could have, in the natural, have been defeated by a little shepherd's boy with a sling. And, it, and so he used his weapons plus the anointing of God that was on his life. And what he said to, to uh, Goliath when he faced him on the field of conflict was, he said, you're coming against me with your sword and with your spear. But he didn't say, I'm coming against you with the shepherd sling. He said, I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord. And the weapon of the shepherd sling would have been ineffective had it not been for the power of the Lord, the anointing of God's Spirit that was on David. And so the things that we cannot take up ourselves are the things that, and things that we can't see, but are our weapons, salvation. He said, above all, the helmet, salvation. And he said, take also the, the uh, sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then finally, and this is one that most people overlook, when, because these other weapons that are being mentioned are all uh, symbolic, you know, a shield, uh, loins, gird, shoes, but now he's talking about something that's very literal, and he says, prayer in the Spirit. And that is as much as a weapon as all the other weapons that are mentioned there in that, uh, in that passage. So we, today we are, we're confronted with enemies that we cannot see with our eyes, and we are armed with weapons that we've taken up and now that along with the anointing, the ability that God gives us, those are the things that empower us to overcome in the battles that we face. The anointing of the Holy Spirit upon our life, putting the weapons to use and making them uh, effective. So I want to read to you just a moment Another passage of Scripture, a text for this morning's um, message coming from 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning reading with verse 3. Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing, into, uh, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is Fulfilled. And when you read this passage of Scripture, you, you begin to understand that our, our, our warfare, the, the battleground is in the realm of the realm of the spirit, but the, the, the realm of our mind. And the weapons that we fight with are our thoughts and our words. And what we believe, these are the things, the weapons that bring us victory, and this is the thing that we use to combat these unseen forces. The battleground's not where we thought it was. The enemy wasn't who we thought it was. The weapons we fight with are not things we see in the natural, but the entire battle is a battle uh, in, in the realm of the spirit, and that's why this battle that we're fighting is not temporal, but it's absolutely eternal. It's not finite, it's infinite. And the victories that we win are not short-lived, but they are absolutely eternal. Well, it's infinite. 
And that's why it's important that we put these uh, battles, this warfare in the highest priority. This is uh, more important than anything that we do, the things that we experience. The greatest area in our life that we must put highest priority is that we live in victory in the realm of the, of the Spirit. So how do we find ourselves armed and and uh, given the skills, the abilities to put these weapons, our thoughts, our words. Because I'll tell you what happens. Can I tell you? We come to church perhaps for, for an hour and a half on Sunday morning or two hours. And we, for a while, all collect our thoughts and we center them on the Lord. And then when we walk out the door and we're not going to be back now for a few days at least, if not a week or, or longer. And we leave behind us all the significant things that God had spoken into our lives, the new ideas that we had taken hold of. We leave behind us the words that we have taken as being weapons to give us victory, and we don't intend to pick them up again until we get back to church. Now, I'm not going to tell you you never fight a spiritual battle at church. I'd say, in fact, is a lot of times people have fought spiritual battles in church. But that's not necessarily where you're going to really face your battles. It's not necessarily where the enemy's going to show up. You're sitting between two Holy Ghost-filled saints shouting and praising God and dancing up and down the aisles. That's not the time that you've got to worry necessarily about getting your mind in the right place and getting your words in the right place because everybody's, in that time, we got our mind focused in the right direction. But we walk out the door, get in our car, and by the time we get to the house, our whole car load of family going home from church, all fighting like a bunch of cats and dogs. And, and the words that we say are not building up the kingdom of God. Instead, they are distracting from what God's building in our lives and in our homes. Because now we've started letting terrible things, first of all, terrible thoughts reign in our mind. And then those thoughts take in the form of words and we speak terrible things, awful things. And instead of the, speaking the words that bring us victory, we speak words that bring us bondage. Instead of speaking the words that draw us together, we speak words that separate us and divide us. And then the next thing you know, we think, well, why, why is our walk so weak? Why, why don't we have more power? In our walk? Well, because we've been using these wrong words. Our weapons are all about bringing thoughts into captivity. You know what? I, I, I realized that um, as a child, I had too big an overdose of cowboys on Saturday morning. I mean, it was the Lone Ranger. It was Roy Rogers on the television set every Saturday morning. I can't remember the rest, but those guys I remember, the, the, the Kimo Sabi and the uh, Tonto and, and Roy and Dale and Pat Br Br No, you all don't watch that stuff? Good. But I did, and I got this thing that I knew that two things going to happen at the end of every Roy Rogers episode. Now, I knew this would happen. First thing would be that Roy would come in and get the drop on the bad guy and put a gun on him and say, stick him up. And he'd throw his hands up. But it never ended just that way. See, today, the bad guys, you've got to take care of the bad guys. You watch any of these cop shows today and you've got to take care of the bad guys. You know, arrest them soft. 
Take care of them. Don't hurt them. But that wasn't the way it was with Roy. You, he could never make an arrest until he beat the snot out of somebody. Oh, that's not politically correct. But Roy lived in a different day, so he couldn't just go in and arrest somebody quietly. They had to have a big brawl, and Roy had to knock the snot out of them. Every week, Roy would have to jump off a trigger and grab the guy off of his horse and fall out on the ground and go rolling down the hill. And it happened every week. And I knew when the fight was about over. The fight was about over when Roy fell down and the guy would come after him and Roy would always, every week, get his feet on the chest of that guy and kick him off. And when he did, you knew this fight was just about over because Roy was getting ready to just mop the floor with that guy. Crazy thing happened. Roy was just a little old guy, you know what? And he beat up those big guys every week. It's just fantastic how that happened. Well... Listen to what happens here. Now, I put those things into practice in this warfare that I'm talking to you about. And I'm talking about putting your thoughts under arrest. You know you think things you shouldn't think. But what do you do? You let those bad thoughts rattle around inside your brain. That, Well, you say, well what should I do? You say, you, when you think one of those thoughts that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Remember what I was saying? Let God be true. And every man a lot. Let every other witness that opposes the knowledge of God, it's a lie. Put it under arrest. You say, you are under arrest. I will not let you go. I'm not going to let that foul thought bang around inside my heart. I'm not going to let that thing destroy me, weaken me, take away my faith. I'm not going to let that happen. And when that thought appears inside my mind, I have to say, in the name of Jesus, let God be true, every man a liar, every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, I put you under arrest. I will not let you go inside my mind. I'm going to absolutely insist that the things I think about line up with the Word of God. And I won't add anything to that, and I won't take anything away from that. The truth of God's Word is what will set you free. If you want to be in bondage, then you believe any lie that the devil puts into your mind. But if you want to be set free, make up your mind. I will not believe anything but what the Word of God has said. Let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. So this begins with absolutely full adherence to what the Word of God said. I believe God, and anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, I absolutely put under uh, arrest, and I will not let it have its effect on me. And then I make sure that the things that come out of my mouth line up with the truth. I will not allow myself to say things that are not in line with the Word of God. Why? Well, because those things that come out of your mouth are the things that defile you. I really used to have a problem with the Scripture. Boy, it started making sense. Jesus said, you know, it's not what man eats that defiles him. It's what comes out of his mouth. And I understood about the part about what comes out of your mouth it comes from your heart. I understood that, but... I thought, now, Jesus, are you really trying to stress some, you know, to kind of make a point? Because people could eat something that could make them sick. You know, you could eat. I, I have. I've eaten stuff, got maybe food poison somewhere. Have you ever? It's the worst thing you can get that I know of. And uh, maybe not last too long, but you think it's going to kill you because you ate something that was, you know, it, and, and so, you, well, Lord, what do you mean what eats doesn't defile? See, he didn't say it wouldn't make you sick. He said it won't defile you. In other words, if you eat something that you probably shouldn't eat, it will go into your stomach, but it don't, doesn't go into your heart. 
it, it might make you sick, but it doesn't defile you. What defiles you is what is in your heart and comes out of your mouth. That's what puts you in defilement. That's what puts sin in control. What puts the devil in control in your life is what comes out of your mouth, what you say. And so insist that what you say lines up with what the Word of God is. And so to have the anointing on your life so that the weapons that God has put in your life, have them at work, have them effective in your life, how does that come about? First of all, I'm going to go back to the Scripture when Paul said, so pray. Pray with supplication. Pray. Uh, someone said, well, what does that mean to say supplication? We had a prayer meeting going on here at the church one night it was just me and Linda and Sister Heaton. It was supposed to have been for everybody, but that's who showed up. And so we were here praying, and we had had such a weekend. Late Friday night and early Saturday morning, and we had been working all day on Saturday. And so I suppose that's why some of the folks didn't join us, is they were probably busy too. But we came back for prayer meeting Saturday night, and it just Linda and me and Sister Heaton, and um, I was down here in the floor praying, and I just lay down in the floor thinking I was going to pray, but the first thing you know, I don't know how long I'd been laying there, but after a while, I made a, uh, I was, <laughs> you said, were you snoring? Oh, no, I was, I was just groaning that with those groanings that can't be uttered, you know, it, and, uh, you know, at different times, I know everybody's done this one time or another. You, you, you snored, and it woke you up. You know? And so that kind of happened to me. I was, I'd snored. I realized that I'd snored. And I wasn't completely jarred awake, but I did, oh, I'd snored. And I heard Sister Heaton say to Sister Dylan, oh, bless him, Lord. <laughs> and... And Linda said, oh, did he go to sleep? And she said, oh, no, I think he's just in supplication. <laughs> Every one of you been against me at one time or another, but never Sister Heaton. <laughs> and... <laughs> So let me tell you, I don't really think that gets to count for supplication, but, but I'll tell you what, it's so important that people develop a prayer life. I'm not talking about the ability to pray. I'm talking about a prayer life. If you want the power of God to be in operation in your life and bring you through victory, Develop a prayer life. You say, what does that mean? That means to make an appointment with God and keep it. You know how to get close to God? Make a promise to God and keep it. And the way to develop a, a, a prayer life is to make an appointment and keep it. And if you don't, you will probably not have any kind of a prayer life. If you think, I'll pray when I get time, then you probably will not get time. But if you will set an appointment, you'll have a time. And if you will keep it, God marks that as faithfulness on your part. And you say, well, I really am not very good at wording my prayer. I don't know what to say. I don't know how that I should pray. You know what, though, first of all, that I suppose that probably develops with your putting it into practice. But whether that's true or not, I'm here to tell you that your faithfulness to keep your promise to God is more important than having the right words to say to call upon Him. Linda leads us in a song a lot of times that I love so much that says, you don't have to know how to pray all you have to know how to say is jesus i believe that i believe that it doesn't matter if you are in a crowded room or at home 
all alone. Doesn't matter if you're saying it in a shouted voice or in a whispered tone. You just say, Jesus. But if you will faithfully keep your appointment to talk with God, you will find, first of all, that you're developing a real prayer life. And secondly, you'll find that God is so excited about you making a promise to him and keeping it. Don't make a promise and fail to keep it. Better never to promise something than to promise God and not keep it. But make your promise to God and keep it. And the, the result of that is going to be that he is going to give you a life of power. These weapons that I'm talking to you about today are available to everybody. But the ones that have the ability to use them are, first of all, those people that have developed a life of prayer and supplication. These are times when those prayers begin to take over your mind until you may not be on your knees, you may not be have a, a Bible open in front of you, you may not have your eyes closed, but your prayer life has taken over your thinking. And so your thoughts are still on the Lord even though that your prayer time is over. This is what Paul was talking about when he talked to us about praying without ceasing. Continuously, our communication with God continues when we have been anchored by a resilient prayer life. And then having our conversation in such a way that we build up strength rather than tear it down. It, everybody talks to somebody, you know. You, somebody says, well, I just talk to myself. And, and that's all right. You, I just hate when you argue. That's when you... I, I know that when Paul was talking about being filled with the Spirit, he said, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's all right to talk to yourself, but try not to get in an argument. And, but our conversation, the, the, the things that we say, we need to make a point to speak the words that bring power rather than defeat. We need to get around people. Now, occasionally you're going to be around someone negative. That's just part of life. But on purpose, get around people that will talk the word with you and get in agreement with you that speaks power to one another rather than defeat and discouragement. Get with somebody that believes the word of God to be action. And you speak that to them and they speak it to you and the result is going to be that the anointing gets stirred up inside your heart. I'm going to just um, speak one more thing to you today and we're going to come to altar service we're going to pray for you today somewhere someone got a uh, a uh, a fly in the ointment uh, got a cockle burl under the saddle blanket I, I don't know about the term impartation I'd like everyone to say with me, impartation. Impartation. Somewhere someone got the idea that that was a bad thing. In fact, some of our leaders in this fellowship wrote a paper that we didn't believe in impartation. And I said, really? Really? I'm thinking about Peter and John on... Uh, day shortly after the day of Pentecost, walking into the gate, beautiful. And a crippled man was sitting there begging for alms. And he said, Peter looked at him and said, look on us. The Bible said he looked at him expecting to receive a gift. You're going to get some, get some money. But Peter said, 
Silver and gold have I none. But he did have something else. He said, such as I have, I'm going to give that to you. That is impartation. Such as I have, give I you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And with that, he took a hold of his hand and pulled him to his feet. And the Bible said that that man went walking and leaping and praising God. Impartation. Now listen to what I'm going to tell you. Because someone was offended that we would say impartation, that we would say that someone lay hands on you and there'll be something imparted to your life. But that's what ha happened there. Peter said, such as I have, give I you. Then when people came running to them and looking on them, what's happened? This, but we've seen this man for 38 years come up here and beg for alms. He's been a cripple all these years. Now he's walking and leaping, praising God. And Peter said, why are you looking at us? as through our power, our holiness, that we've helped this man. This man has been helped because Jesus Christ of Nazareth and the power in that name has made him strong and he's walking today. And if I tell you today that we are going to lay hands on you and believe for impartation, that isn't because we believe that we're better than you. That doesn't mean that we've got anything that you don't have already. When we lay our hands on your head, there's no fire in that hand. There's no gold dust in that hand. There's no oil coming out of that hand today. I mean, we could anoint with oil, but I mean, as far as the hand, that hand is just flesh and bone, blood, skin. That's all that is. But it's a point of contact. It's me releasing my faith and you releasing your faith. And I have faith that the touch of God comes upon your life today and gives you the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, I believe in all those weapons that you've talked about. I believe in the shield of faith. I believe in the breastplate of righteousness. I believe having my feet shod with the preparation of, God, of the gospel, but I'm still getting beat up out here. That's because what you need is the anointing to make those weapons work. What you need is the touch of God. And it's not the touch of Dylan. It's the touch of God. It's not the touch of Riley. It's, it's the touch of God that's going to make the difference in your life today. And that point of contact, when we release our faith, you release your faith. The power of the Holy Spirit is going to erupt inside you and all those weapons that you've carried around, maybe you've worn them in the right places, but now they're going to be effective more so because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit that is in your life today.